Whenever we think of American territorial expansion, our minds typically go to the Louisiana Purchase, the Mexican-American War, and of course the Purchase of Alaska. Prior to its sale to the United States, the land we know as Alaska was a colonial possession of the Russian Empire, a direct continuation of their land-based eastward expansion, which eventually brought them to discover the American Pacific Coast. Russia initially hoped for an Arctic route which would make travel from one part of their empire to another quick and cost-effective, but alas, this wouldn't be the case. North America did, however, offer a unique opportunity for the Russians, a dream of carving out a personal Pacific dominion from which it could dominate trade with the Asian Pacific realm, much as the Western powers had come to dominate the Atlantic. This would lead the Russians to establish colonies along the coasts of Alaska and California. They even briefly attempted to acquire Hawaii, but abandoned the project upon the realization that given Russia's lackluster navy and the rapid advancements of the West, Attempting to protect such an overseas possession from conquest by Britain or the later United States would be virtually impossible, and thus to invest in it now would be a waste of resources. The same would eventually prove true for California, which Russia utilized for as long as it possibly could with as little effort as possible, knowing very well it intended to abandon the colony once it became inconvenient. This strategy would also be applied to Alaska, where Russia had found good use of it for purposes of fur gathering, this colony attracted more settlers and saw greater development than any other Russian overseas possession, but still a lack of major interest from the imperial government would ultimately leave the Alaskan colony neglected until finally it was deemed a liability and sold to the United States for a generously low price. One might wonder why not sell to neighboring Canada instead? Canada might appear the obvious choice from a geographic perspective, but Russia at the time had just been crippled by Britain during the Crimean War, and the Russians weren't particularly fond of the thought of handing a new possession over to a colony of their foremost rival, in turn strengthening their hold over the Pacific. Instead, Russia opted to sell to the United States, who at this time were seen as friendly to Imperial Russia and fiercely anti-British. Selling to the US meant not only compensation for the colony, but a disadvantaging of Britain by giving the United States incentive to expand into the western Canadian coast, something which the US legally pursued following the Civil War but abandoned not long after. Although this conquest of Canadian lands by the US never came to pass, the United States still made excellent use of Alaska, extracting from it various natural resources including gold and oil, developing the would-be state far beyond what Russia had achieved prior. But things almost went in a very different direction. Allow us to introduce Liechtenstein, a German microstate situated between Austria and Switzerland, whose total land area stands at merely some 60 square miles. It is a landlocked country, possessed an army of under 100 men which it would eventually disband, and is only slightly bigger than the borough of Staten Island. Yet, despite these drawbacks, Imperial Russia supposedly first offered to sell its overseas colony to the Prince of Liechtenstein for an even lower price than was offered to the United States. Now, surely this is a joke. Well, the Russian Tsar of the time might have chuckled when he first considered it, but regardless of whether that's the case or not, the proposal apparently did occur, with even Liechtenstein's current royal family supporting the claim. Why Russia would favor this small principality to inherit its far-off colony is still unknown. Liechtenstein is far from capable of effectively defending Alaska should Britain attempt to simply annex it. Liechtenstein, though a relatively wealthy nation today, was nowhere near able to finance the development of a land several thousand times its own size, especially at this early point in its own economic development. Liechtenstein wouldn't even have a population large enough to effectively settle such a massive territory. So then we must ask, what was Russia thinking? One possible explanation for Russia's decision can be found in Liechtenstein's special relationship to its neighbors. The principality had long been an essential satellite of the Austrian Habsburg Empire. The royal families of both states being rather close to the point that the Prince of Liechtenstein would often spend more time in Austria than within his own realm. We might assume, given Liechtenstein's non-threatening nature, that by handing Alaska over to them, Russia was essentially removing it from play, no longer needing to care for the colony by placing it in the hands of a harmless power, while preventing Britain from invading it lest they stir up trouble with Austria by proxy. The issue is that by this point there likely wouldn't be much that Austria could do regardless. See, by 1867, when the deal was allegedly made, Austria had already been diminished on the European scene following its loss to Prussia in the Austro-Prussian War of 1866. Austria was now a secondary European power expelled from the German realm and forced to grant greater autonomy to the Hungarian portion of its empire. Whatever securities it might offer to Liechtenstein's colony to deter British annexation by this point are virtually non-existent. Even so, Russia and Austria were not on the best of terms, and thus it seems strange for Russia to offer one of their territories to an Austrian ally, 
Though to be fair, Russia held suspicions toward most of the European powers and probably didn't expect Liechtenstein or Austria capable of effectively developing the region, at least not as much as Spain, France, or Britain might have. That, of course, is all speculation. For whatever reason, the offer was made, but rejected by Liechtenstein, who simply couldn't afford to pay or care for this far-off territory. But what if that changed? What if despite the great unlikelihood for this to have occurred, Liechtenstein somehow managed to purchase, hold, and develop Alaska as its own colony? But first, a word from our sponsor, Ridge Wallet. The holiday season is here, and while the most valuable gift you can give is to spend this festive time with your friends and family, you know how important it is to go the extra step and find each of them something special. Shopping for a gift that's just right can be tough, especially when stores are closing left and right, but everyone needs a wallet. Sure, you could spend a bundle on wallets that wear out and fade with time, but when it comes to Ridge Wallet, you'll be buying a gift that lasts a lifetime. Every wallet is insured by a lifetime guarantee and is made of hard, durable materials like aluminum, titanium, carbon fiber, and now Damascus steel and 18 karat gold. Ridge wallets are built to take up half the space of a leather wallet while still allowing you to carry up to 15 cards and plenty of cash. Get yours today when you go to ridge.com slash monsterz and use promo code monsterz at checkout for 10% off your order and free worldwide shipping. If you're not satisfied with your product, feel free to return it within 45 days for a full refund. Now. Back to the video. For Liechtenstein to successfully keep Alaska, it would initially need the support of its two neighbors. The Swiss, then undergoing a process of mass industrial and economic advancement, and whom Liechtenstein had been fostering positive economic ties with, could offer financial support to its budding ally for a partial stake in the colony's ownership. However, without Austria's ability to ensure the security of the colony and without their own means of reaching it, such an investment just appears too risky. We might suppose then that following the Austro-Prussian War, with Austria ousted from German politics and humiliated by Prussia, that it instead sets its sights abroad. Austria would have lost its coastal Venetian territories to Italy during the war, but for the time still possessed a coastline along the Adriatic, and at this time Austria had already begun a program of naval expansion in response to the growing threat of Sardinia and a united Italy. The Austrian navy lagged behind that of France and Britain, but was quickly advancing under the guidance of naval commander-in-chief Ferdinand Maximilian, the same Maximilian who briefly served as Emperor of Mexico before being executed just weeks prior to Russia's Alaska proposition. Under Ferdinand Max, Austria's navy saw an essential rebirth. Shipbuilding was modernized, ports were developed, and scientific voyages were carried out, seeing to the first successful circumnavigation of the globe by an Austrian warship. Following Max's death, only Admiral Wilhelm von Tegethoff would remain to continue his naval work, but after his own passing in 1871, Austrian naval advancement would slow to a crawl. While not essential to the scenario and a divergence point all on its own, had Maximilian survived his reign in Mexico and successfully fled back to Austria, the Austrians would have likely achieved a near-dominant naval presence in the Mediterranean within two decades, and gained the ability to project their influence further overseas than in our timeline, something which would certainly help this scenario, but which we'll save for another time. In our world, Austria followed its defeat at the hands of Prussia by investing itself in the Balkans. But this time, and far-fetched as it might be, things are different. The Prince of Liechtenstein, after receiving Russia's offer, corresponds with his Habsburg and Swiss allies, proposing to them a joint colonial venture. The Swiss never established any colonies of their own, however had historically piggybacked off the ventures of other empires, settling large numbers of their population in North and South America as well as in Australia, often jumping on free grants of land to help develop underpopulated territories. Their involvement would come at the cost of granting a near monopoly on Alaskan trade to the newly established Swiss American Trading Company, as well as providing land grants for up to 10,000 Swiss families. The Austrians had at various points expressed interest in building an overseas empire with a handful of opportunities seen in this era alone. However, now found the Hungarians vetoing all policies related to overseas colonization and naval expansion. This significantly held Austria's colonial development back, most notably discouraging the acquisition of colonies in Africa during the Berlin Conference and following Spain's offer of its Saharan territories. This presents another roadblock to making this scenario work, but for the sake of this video we'll just suggest Austria is able to persuade Hungary to cooperate. Asia was quickly becoming a major zone of focus for Europe, and with the rise of Japan and the US's entry into the Pacific realm, so did the Asian Pacific become a major center of global interest. Austria, if in fact it could do so, would be wise to invest itself in this region. 
Austria's involvement would come at the cost of allowing Austrian ships, both merchant and military, to be freely stationed in Alaska, rights to a fraction of all resource wealth extracted from the colony, land grants for 8,000 Austrian families, and special economic privileges so that Austria and its citizens might trade with the colony tariff-free. In essence, Alaska would become politically a territory of Liechtenstein, economically a trade hub of Switzerland, and militarily an extension of Austria. Liechtenstein gains prestige and opportunity from the territory, Switzerland, land and wealth, Austria a strategic advantage in the Far East. As we mentioned before, Liechtenstein is both one of Europe's and the world's smallest countries. It also has a population of only 38,000 and actually a surprisingly high GDP of 6.2 billion. But had they purchased Alaska, Liechtenstein would grow to become 11,000 times larger making it the 17th largest country in the world in terms of area. Its population would also grow to become 770,000, assuming Alaska settled in a similar fashion to in our world, and its GDP would grow to become almost 10 times larger at 60.6 .6 billion, making Liechtenstein the 75th largest economy in the world. This would all make Liechtenstein quite a different nation, as it would now be mostly based around Alaska and North America. Even though a purchase of Alaska wouldn't make Liechtenstein a major power or anything, it would certainly have a lot more political sway in the world, as it would now be at least a notable nation in North America, which the United States would likely attempt to keep close ties to, due to its proximity to Russia. Also worth mentioning is the hypothetical union between Liechtenstein, Switzerland, and Austria-Hungary, which would emerge in this alternate 1867. Here Liechtenstein started out with a population of only around 7,000, but if we were to include its now emerging economic and military union with Switzerland and Austria-Hungary, it would stand at almost 38.5 million. Russia would oversee the colony until the first waves of Liechtenstein settlers arrived about a year later. Among them would be a majority population of ethnic Germans, followed by large populations of Slavs and Hungarians, and a handful of Italians. The importance of long-distance communication with Europe for purposes of defense and shipping would demand all new settlers be capable of speaking German. Austria had seen firsthand the difficulties caused by miscommunication and mistranslation during its longer voyages, and would consider a shared language essential to the colony's success. Switzerland and Liechtenstein being largely German countries as well would agree to this policy. Russia would become immediately skeptical of Austrian involvement in Alaska's colonization and move to bolster its own Far Eastern fleet should military engagement become necessary, but otherwise would support the transition and remain cautiously supportive. Liechtenstein would act as a regular mediator in Austro-Russian disputes moving forward, knowing well that the security of Alaska hinged on the two remaining not aggressive. The first major conflict to be set the colony would come about three decades later during the Klondike Gold Rush. The Yukon province of northwestern Canada would have seen a flood of prospectors arrive from both the Canadian East and the U.S., bringing to the Klondike region an unprecedented wave of migration. At first, this would have appeared beneficial to the Alaskan settlement as Americans would sail up to the Alaskan coast before carrying on to the Yukon, doing business within Alaska both upon arrival and following for purposes of resupply. However, as prospects in the Yukon dried up, Alaska became a prime target for prospectors, especially after gold was discovered there as well. This mass influx of prospectors would become overwhelming for Alaska and eventually lead to violence as some began claiming portions of Alaska for themselves and their home countries, the average American not thinking much of Liechtenstein's ability to protect its colony. However, by this point a respectable population size had been achieved, local industries were well established, and a dependable number of ships and soldiers stood at the ready. The German Alaskans would successfully take up arms against the foreign prospectors and drive them out, in turn souring ties with Britain, Canada, and the US. Canada and Liechtenstein would find themselves in a minor war over the southern Alaskan coast, with Canada ultimately determining the conflict to not be worth continuing, bringing a sense of pride to the local German Alaskans for having successfully defended their land, one they now knew to be rich in precious metals. To Liechtenstein, Alaska would be an even greater colonial gem than the Congo was to Belgium. It brought Liechtenstein a status in Europe that could hardly have been imagined prior, though one it shared with its Swiss and Austrian neighbors. Given Austria's more active role in overseas colonialism, we could imagine this would lead them to seek out colonial possessions within Africa during the Berlin Conference and to accept Spain's offer of its Western Saharan territory. Austria would be most likely to claim lands in East Africa so as to have a reliable port into the Indian Ocean, from where it could continue further into the Pacific and onto Alaska. Realistically, Austria would not have been willing to sacrifice its land empire for an overseas colonial empire as evidenced by their continued cooperation with Hungary, 
However, in the spirit of this scenario, we'll assume Austria has now found overseas expansion to be far more lucrative, and decides to part ways with Hungary early on so as to focus on naval development. Consequently, this also means Austria is no longer a Balkan power, removing the trigger for what would have been the Great War. Liechtenstein would likely encourage Austria's separation from Hungary and the Balkans as a means of preventing further hostilities between Austria and Russia, who held wide-reaching ambitions in the mostly Slavic and Orthodox Balkans. Ultimately, Liechtenstein's purchase of Alaska would have redirected Austria's focus away from a Great War powder keg and the final instrument of its own destruction, allowing it to flourish as a major naval power in the Mediterranean and a state capable of projecting its influence across the globe. Switzerland, though still a relatively neutral state, would come to form the heart of South German economics and become a close friend of Austria, taking off as a major economic power earlier on than in our world, thanks to its wise investing and now further reaching influence. And Liechtenstein, through it all, would be remembered as Europe's negotiating superpower, a microstate who brought together a great power in a developing backwater to build a rich and respected empire thousands of times its original size. The US of Z thanks you for watching, support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.